Good afternoon. I'm Harold Holzer, director of Roosevelt House. And on behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb, welcome to the second of three New Deal related book discussions that we're hosting in June. Uh, as, we, as we head toward what we assume and we hope will be the end of uh, 15 months of lockdown and the renewal in one form or, or another of some form of public programming in person in the fall. You've been terrifically patient and loyal to these programs and um, we appreciate your following them as tempting as it's become to go outside in this beautiful weather, uh, go back to restaurants, et cetera. But these programs are so great, we're happy that you're not missing them. And this afternoon, we're focusing on Scott Borchert's new study, Republic of Detours, How the New Deal Paid Broke Writers to Rediscover America, a story that includes writers like Saul Bellow, Studs Terkel, Richard Wright, John Cheever, and Zora Neale Hurston, among many others, all of whom found encouragement, sustenance, and security on the payroll, payroll of the New Deal Federal Writers Project. I'm going to uh, skip the expansive kind of introduction I customarily devote to programs that are this compelling, uh, because as you may have read today, we've lost a giant of the Roosevelt world our own pioneering supporter, uh, longtime advisory board member, and champion of all things Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, Ambassador William Vanden Heuvel, who died yesterday at the age of 91. I know Bill was with us for last year, last week's uh, opening program in this series, Why the New Deal Matters, and was looking forward to this evening's installment, but alas, it was not to be. So on behalf of the entire Roosevelt House family and President Rabb, for, for all of whom he made such an enormous difference for so long and was such a good friend, I want to express our deepest sympathy to Melinda, Katrina, and the entire Vanden Heuvel family, and to salute Bill for his years of commitment to Roosevelt House. As some of you may know, we're in the process of uh, planning to rename the, the elevator on the west side of Roosevelt House, the very elevator that Franklin Roosevelt himself, Bill's hero, once used to navigate the house once he recovered enough strength from his bout with polio 100 years ago this year to begin uh, getting about and uh, begin contemplating a return to public life. The elevator and the story, of course, meant much to Bill, who you may know at age 14, hitchhiked from his home in upstate New York to Hyde Park because he felt he had to go to the funeral of his hero in 1945. He was stopped at the uh, gates by uh, security officers, but Eleanor saw this young kid and went over and said, you're welcome to come. And that's how our own Bill, probably one of the last people who has survived from Franklin Roosevelt's 1945 funeral, got into Hyde Park and began his lifelong association with all buildings, libraries, parks, and for us, public policy institutes honoring Franklin and Eleanor. We fondly remember the day he brought his memoir, Hope and History, to Roosevelt House in 2019. And that's really what Bill stood for exploring and acknowledging Roosevelt history and raising hopes for the future in public policy and human rights based on the Roosevelt family's extraordinary influence and impact. So thank you, Bill, for everything, professionally and personally. We will miss you very much. Tonight, we welcome Scott Borchert, who has written in many magazines and journals, even as he served as an assistant editor in the book publishing world. I hope he tells us why the Federal Writers Pro Project inspired him to branch out from book editing to book writing, but I'm eagerly awaiting his take on this neglected subject. To serve as interlocutor, we're happy to welcome another veteran of the book publishing world, Gerald Howard, who edited 
in his day, such writers as, as William S. Burroughs, Walter Mosley, David Foster Wallace, and whose own essays have appeared in the New York Times Book Review and other public publications. Um, we're very pleased to, uh, to try to lift ourselves from our own depression today with a talk about what lifted writers up during the Great Depression. Maybe it's the perfect uh, antidote for how we're feeling today and the perfect topic for a Roosevelt House book discussion. I know Bill would have loved it. So with that, it's a pleasure to welcome Scott Borchert and Gerald Howard. Hi, Scott. Hey, how are you? Very good. Greetings from Brewster, Massachusetts. Um, and, and thank you to Harold Holzer and Roosevelt House for um, sponsoring uh, this conversation. And um, gee, it's, it's such a pleasure for me to be able to do this with you, Scott, and to talk about your history, the Federal Writers Project, which is just about as unlikely a governmental success story as has ever been told. I mean, literally thousands of, as your subtitle has it, um, broke writers and broke editors and mm -hmm. proofreaders and typists and other white collar word workers were put on governmental salaries to research, write, edit, and produce a really huge number of guidebooks to the American scene in all 48 states um, and the District of Columbia. And so in the depths of the depression, when the foundations of American democracy were, were just under enormous stress from economic calamity, the workers of the FWP were really quite literally engaged in, the, in, a, in a vast project to rediscover America, um, its history and, and its very purpose. Um, so the Federal Writers Project was part of a larger cultural project called uh, I think Federal One, um, mm -hmm. That's right. which was in turn part of Harry Hopkins Works Progress Administration. So it was a pure product of the New Deal, which makes it so pleasing that we're, being, we're talking under the aegis of the, of the Roosevelt House. It's, it's really impossible to imagine anything like the FWP arising uh, in any other time or any other circumstance than, than the early years of the Roosevelt administration, but, but we'll get into this. We can dream, certainly. Um, and I'll, I'll turn the floor over to you in a second. I, but I just want to say that I was really delighted when your editor, Alex Starr, sent me the galley of Republica detours because I've been immersed in the 1930s and this literary politics in the course of writing a biography of uh, Malcolm Cowley who's a major figure in that milieu and shows up in your book a fair amount, not as a figure, but as a commentator on, on, the, on the scene. And, um, and you, you even point out that as a literary editor of the New Republic, he was running his own kind of relief project as well by, by giving work to broke writers and books to sell at the Strand. And, um, um, and I connected with your, book in literally dozens of places and um, and you capture the feelings and the facts so beautifully. And, and I'd like to actually have you demonstrate that uh, by having you read a, some par a couple of paragraphs of your book that will set the scene and, and give people a sense of how um, fluently um, this book reads, which is no small achievement. So over to you. Sure, I'd be happy to. And um, before I start, let me just say thanks also to the Roosevelt House for hosting this conversation and to Jerry for being a part of it. And of course, to everyone tuning in today, um, I'm really honored that everyone is here and everyone would be wanting to watch this. So thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs here um, since we are on a Zoom call and it's probably not all that interesting for me to be reading at length from the book. Um, but I should say uh, what I'm describing here is this Phenomenon that kind of happened in uh, around 1937 and over the next five or six years, these guidebooks started appearing to all the different states. There are 48 states then, to some of the major cities, regions, places like Death Valley, um, routes like US-1. And these guidebooks were popping up in bookstores. They were getting reviewed in newspapers and magazines. People were buying them, they were reading them, um, but they kind of came from a very unusual place. So I'm gonna just describe that and what these guides were like when people bought them. Because I think for a lot of readers at the time, they saw a travel guide to 
New York City or something, and they figured it would just give them directions on where to go and what to see and that sort of thing. But then when they actually picked up one of these books, they found that it was much more unusual than uh, what they would expect. So this is how I describe them in the book, and I'll just read this pretty quickly. Um, yeah. These books sprawled. They hoarded and gossiped and sat you down for a lecture. They seemed to address multiple readers at once from multiple perspectives. They ran to hundreds of pages. They contained a melange of essays, historical tidbits, folklore, anecdotes, photographs, and social analysis, along with an abundance of driving directions thickened by tall tales, strange sights, and bygone characters. They were deeply researched on subjects of little use to a traveler, the structure of local government, the state's literary residence. While they barely mentioned diners, motels, and gas stations, they were rich and weird and frustrating. Most of the state guides were divided into three sections. First, perplex readers page through essays on history, industry, folk ways, and other subjects. Then came profiles of notable cities and towns. And finally, a collection of automobile tours across the state. The tours highlighted scenic overlooks and recreation spots, but they were also dense with Indian massacres, labor strikes, witches, gunfighters, continental army spies, Confederate deserters, shipwrecks, slave rebellions, famous swindlers, and forgotten poets. They traveled through towns with bizarre names and towns founded by religious cults. They pointed out architectural curiosities, dubious monuments, and decayed trading posts. They paused for every old timer's story that could be fastened to a patch of ground. They knew of ghosts on every road. They mentioned all the places where Washington ever slept and where Lincoln was ever born. They guided tourists across the land, but also deep into the national character, into a past that was assembled from the mythic and the prosaic, the factual and the farcical. The tours seemed less accessories for motorists than rambling day trips through the unsorted mind of the Republic. And the shaggy opulence, this Americana maximalism, made the guides unusual, but their provenance made them remarkable. They weren't issued by some erratic publisher or obsessive compulsive tourist association. They were, in fact, created by the federal government. And that's where the story of the Federal Writers Project really begins. Oh, that's pretty <laughs> nice writing, if I do say so. So you make a pretty large claims for the Federal Writers Project. You, you call it the largest literary project in history and the most ambitious national literary project ever attempted anywhere. Um, so could you tell us in broad or specific terms just what, uh, why you make those claims and how you justify them? Sure. I mean, up to that point, I don't think there's anything really comparable that had happened in modern history. Um, the way the Federal Writers Project was set up, they had an office in Washington, D.C., where the main editors and kind of architects of the project all worked. They directed things from there. And then they opened up offices in every single state in the country. So every, I think it was usually the largest city had an office. Then there were satellite offices spread out from there. And then there were federal writers who were just out in the field spreading out throughout the entire state. So when you look at that, you had um, thousands of people working at once, covering the entire United States, drawing on their local communities to kind of collect all this information about how people lived, what they were thinking about, what kind of work they did, their folklore, their history, the flora and fauna of the state, you know, amassing all this information, channeling it back to Washington. So the whole effort involved thousands of people. Um, at its peak, I believe the project employed around 6,600 people. It was usually a little less than that, maybe four to 5,000. Um, and there are around, it's estimated, about 10,000 people who work for the project in general. So quite a lot. Um, compared to the entire New Deal, it was actually quite, or not the New Deal, I'm sorry, the Works Progress Administration, it was quite small because the whole WPA employed about 2 million people a month compared to, you know, several thousand that were working for the Federal Writers Project. Um, but in terms of the kind of literary work they're doing, nothing like that had ever really been attempted before. Um, there have, of course, been a lot of guidebooks that have been written by individual authors or teams of authors. Um, there have been scholars who went out and collected folklore or tried to, you know, chart the daily life of people in a certain place. Um, but this kind of collective effort that involved thousands and thousands of people from all walks of life was really completely unprecedented. Um, I should say at this point that we'll be in conversation for about 50 minutes and then we'll be taking questions from the audience and you can put use your Q&A function. Um, so, this was part of the Works Project Progress Administration, which was um, the brainchild of a New Deal, or Harry Hopkins. Uh, he'd been a social worker, and he really didn't. He, his main object wasn't literary or artistic. Uh, he was he was interested in 
giving people jobs. Um, and as far as writers and editors were concerned, he said, hell, they've got to eat just like other people, which is a really lovely sentiment, I think. Um, so could you talk about who got hired and how and why and, and why <laughs> really you had to be down and out and on relief for the most part to get hired if you, yeah, tell, tell us about that because it's one of the odd aspects of the program. Sure, yeah, if you, if you kind of look at the entire WPA, the idea was to give jobs to people who needed them. So there are people who were completely unemployed, had no other resources to fall back on, no other source of income. Um, and they would typically go join up and get these kind of construction jobs, although the WPA did a lot of other things too. Um, so the situation was the same for the Federal Writers Project. Someone who was a writer, had any kind of editorial, research, journalistic background, had to be completely out of work, had nothing else, no other options, and they had to qualify for relief and actually register. Um, in a lot of cases, that involved a social worker coming and checking out your house, doing an interview, making sure you weren't lying or anything and you were actually destitute. Um, and they called that then swearing the pauper's oath. And um, say that again, <laughs> swearing, the what? swearing the pauper's oath. Oh, for God's um, sakes! Is it legally you had to certify that you were, you know, this was your last resort. You had nothing else. And so that actually stopped a not, a not to get off subject, but that stopped a lot of people from wanting to do this because they thought it was a mark of shame um, to be interrogated like that. And they also kind of believed that it could hurt them for their you know, chances of future employment, especially if you're looking at people who are white collar workers, you know, who weren't really used to that kind of uh, poverty that they were going through during the depression. Um, but anyway, that's what people had to do to get on the project. You had to be completely out of work. You needed to, you know, show that you had nothing else and that this job would basically save your life and keep you alive during the depression. Um, people did that. There was a small amount of around 10% of every federal writers project in each state hired people who weren't on relief. And that was typically, um, to get people in the door who were sort of editors and experienced writers and researchers who could work on these and get them going because the people who did show up a lot of times weren't the strongest writers or the best known novelists or poets, although some of them absolutely were. Um, but you have people from really like all walks of life who worked in, uh, you know, writing adjacent professions, I would say, like you had clerks, librarians, recent college graduates who couldn't find a job. Um, people who were copywriters or worked in, um, you know, like real estate, that sort of thing. Priests yeah. and ministers all joined up. Um, so there's a really, really diverse group of people who ended up working for the Writers Project. And we talk about it today as if it was kind of this breeding ground for the best and the brightest literary minds in, you know, U.S. literature. And it's true that a lot of these figures were, you like, know, yeah. Yeah. And absolutely. Yeah, like their, their experiences were all essential to the story of the project, but the vast majority of people who worked on it were never people who published something or published something of any kind of renown and never would in their entire lives. Yeah. But the, oh, I was just going to just to say, but the idea is that they could fulfill the tasks of the project and that from the official point of view was what made them a writer. Right. Um, so I wanted, want you to talk about Henry Alsberg who is the director of the project. And, and I, I believe you call him the crucial visionary of it. An, an interesting man, he, he had a lot of miles on him by the time he um, got this job. He'd been a journalist. He was very close to Emma Goldman, which was a little iffy from the political point of view. Uh, he'd been in theater. He'd never really been a rip roaring success and he, and he sort of washed onto the Washington with the with the, the whole wave of brain trusters who ended up there but he was the right man at the right time to get hired and to do the job so tell us about him yeah he was this really remarkable figure and i had never heard of him until i started researching the federal writers project um, there's a really great biography by uh, Susan DeMasi um, just about him came out a few years ago that tells his entire life story, which is really remarkable. And I only cover a little bit in the book, but he um, is from New York City. He kind of grew up in the um, you know bohemian world of Greenwich Village in the early part of the 20th century, where he heard people like Emma Goldman lecturing. And he was kind of friends with E.E. E. Cummings and all these kind of avant-garde literary figures. Uh, he became a journalist. He went overseas to Europe and he was working for, at one point he was working for the government as kind of an assistant to, in the State Department before World War I broke out. Um, he went back as an aid worker and as a journalist and he traveled across the continent 
into Russia during the age of all these revolutions and then into the Soviet Union. And he saw firsthand the early years of the Soviet Union. Um, at that point, he was, you know, he's a left wing guy. He was pretty sympathetic to the Bolsheviks. And then he quickly kind of changed his mind because he was really more of a philosophical anarchist. And that's kind of how he thought of himself throughout his life. Um, and he wasn't totally comfortable with what was going on in the Soviet Union. I, I have to point out the idea of a philosophical anarchist uh, running an enterprise of 6,000 people across 48 states is, I mean, it tells you how odd <laughs> this whole exactly. project was. Exactly. He he really wasn't, um, you know, a revolutionary or anything like that. Like, he was very sympathetic to the uh, principles of anarchism, but he was more of a, uh, you know, pragmatic kind of figure. So by the time, you know, he went through all these different phases in his life. And by the time the depression rolled around, he'd been writing for different things. He translated a play that was pretty famous on uh, down in the downtown theater scene. He worked in that scene for a little bit as a producer. I think the book, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so that was his, he kind of had a foot in all these different worlds, but he hadn't really accomplished anything great for himself. And then he got a job working for the, the uh, FERA, which was kind of the precursor to the WPA as an editor. Um, a friend of his was working for Harry Hopkins at the time, brought him in, gave him this editing job. So he was around. And when they, uh, that's basically how he got the job for the Federal Writers Project. They needed someone to run it. He was sitting there and someone who was involved with this told a story of how they were having this meet in an office. And they said, all right, who are we gonna get to run this project? And they looked over and Henry Osberg was kind of sitting there and looking very forlorn. And they just kind of said, just give it to him or he'll be very disappointed. So they gave it to him. Um, so he was this really unlikely figure who ended up running it. But like I said, yeah, like he, I called him the crucial visionary because he really saw I think the potential in the project, and he worked as hard as he could to to realize that and to make this his his life's work, um, like marshalling all the talent that the project kind of drew from all across the country and creating these you know valuable guides and other other forms of literature. Um, well, um, yeah, I mean it's really in totally in the spirit of the New Deal, um, which uh, you know sprung from the brain of Roosevelt, but he didn't have a plan. I mean, when I think when you think about the Roosevelt the new deal it's like there's a problem let's throw some acronyms at it yeah. you know um and and it's a miracle how well it turned out but um there there was this amazingly improvisational spirit to the whole enterprise that uh, that's manifest in the choosing of henry Ellsberg and that he turned out to be so um um so good at 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 this job for so long. So your book is structured um, to tell the larger story of the FWP through four figures, um, and and who you you take in their turn. But the but the larger story weaves uh, through their story in a very artful way um, in these in these portraits. And um, so the first figure you bring up is somebody who's really almost totally forgotten now. His name is Vardis Fisher. I mean, I'd heard of him and I thought of him, as, he's from, he was from Idaho. He was from genuine pioneer stock. Um, and I thought of him as a guy who wrote novels about mountain men, you know, but, but he was the real thing. He was a very, he was a reasonably successful novelist. And he was, he was picked to be the head of the, Iowa, uh, excuse me, Idaho um, project. And he's a spiky guy, he's a do it yourself guy, kind of a pain in the ass, and both the right man and the wrong man for the job. Tell, tell us about him and why he was kind of a headache to the home office. Sure, yeah. He, uh, you know, Vardis Fisher for me kind of epitomized the writer who. You know, he's kind of successful. He wrote a few novels that were very well received critically. He had a great reputation. He didn't make much money from them, um, but he lived on this homestead in Idaho, which is kind of how he grew up. And he partially was able to live off the land and support his family that way with his kind of meager writing income. Um, he'd been a professor at different places before that, um, but then he was writing full time by the time the depression rolled around. Um, so he was the sort of person who really needed the Federal Writers Project because he, his income dried up, sales of books like that really disappeared. Um, once the depression set in. Um, so in a lot of ways, I thought, here's this guy who's an emblematic sort of mid-list author, as you would call it in publishing, uh, who found this great job with the Writers Project. 
But it turned out he was this completely one of a kind, just unbelievable character who um, decided early on that he was going to put out the first guidebook of all the guidebooks. And of course, in Washington, they wanted the Washington DC guidebook to come first because naturally that makes more sense. Um, but Fisher said, I'm gonna do it myself. And he also decided that no one else in the state was worthy of working on it except for him. Um, the whole idea of the Federal Writers Project is that it brought you know, many people together in each state to kind of canvas the area, to bring in all different kinds of information to cover all these different aspects of life in the state. Then they would put it all together into a book, edit it, put out this guidebook, and it would be kind of a collective effort. For Vardis Fisher, he was uh, basically decided he was going to do it himself, and he did, more or less. Um, he wrote almost the entire guide by himself. He went out and drove around the whole state in his car doing the tours, and then he'd sit up and write about what he saw, threw it all together, and he informed the office in D.C. and Henry Osberg, who was otherwise really encouraged by all this like productivity that was coming from Idaho and also the really great writing. Um, he told him that his book was ready to go. He found a local publisher, and they were publishing it. And <laughs> Yeah, Caxton, yeah, Caxton in, in Idaho, um, who had published some of his other books before that. And, and when Washington, D.C. objected, he basically said, screw you, and I'm doing it anyway. And he did. Um, so the book came out uh, first of all the Federal, Federal Writers Project guidebooks. There's some, there's some funny stuff in the book about uh, the communication between the home office in Washington and the, and the, and the state offices. And I think at one point, Olsberg or, or his... We should mention his second in command, Catherine Kellogg, mm. who was um, a really considerable figure and kept the trains running on time um, as well. But I, either Alsberg or one of his editors said to Fisher, you can't insult Butte, Idaho like this. You know, um, you can't call it a lousy one horse town or whatever, whatever yeah. he said. And um, I, 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 there's some couple of really funny sentences. Um, there's a guide, there's an, something called the American Guide Manual. You quote, you say, the semicolon should be used cautiously, um, which I think is, you know, yeah, all right. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how helpful that is. And, and, and then in another, some of the field workers, they're all the people who went out and did the research. They were, they were directed to inquire, are there interesting animal colonies? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, there's an aspect to herding cats to this, um, this whole thing that's, that's uh, pretty amusing. Um, and, uh, but the, so the next figure who comes up is the Chicago novelist, Nelson Algren, who was the real bottom dog proletarian thing. I mean, I mean, this is a guy that the program was designed for. He, I mean, he, he had been literally riding the rails for some months and, and I think he, he was so hard up, he stole a typewriter somewhere, was it in Alabama? Uh, Texas. Uh, Texas, Alpine, was Texas. arrested and came like this close to being on a chain gang for this, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, so he was a, a field worker for the Illinois office and, and he wrote, he didn't work on the regular guy, but he wrote auxiliary guides. But this may be a point to bring up the political background of the whole time and how, and how it um, seeped into the, um, uh, the project. I mean, I mean, Bluntly put, American writers had got, uh, really gone hard left, and there are quite a few fellow travelers and uh, Trotskyists and anarchists and um, socialists in there, and um, and Algren and might be representative of that. So talk about him and and his place in the in the uh, whole project. Sure. Yeah, I, I wanted to tell his story because it was kind of a window on uh, that time and the feelings of a lot of writers, especially younger writers um, who had started out or tried to start their careers right around the time of the Depression. Like I think Algren graduated from college, um, you know, right after the Depression really started. And he thought, you know, he, he came from a kind of, you know, lower middle class, working class kind of backgrounds. His parents were immigrants, um, but he went to college, the University of Illinois, I think, or and don't call me out there. He went to college somewhere. Um, and University got, of Illinois. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and he got a degree in journalism. So he thought he was kind of all set up for this great 
journalism job somewhere. And he went out and tried to find work and he couldn't anywhere. And he kind of turned his, uh, you know, like travels around the region to find work into a new literary calling. Um, and he decided to see what was going on to like observe how people were living. And when that was all happening, he really became very radicalized. And he decided that the kind of promises of American democracy and American society had fallen apart because of the depression. He was seeing how people were living. Um, and so he decided, you know, like the problem is not just some faulty policies in Washington or this temporary thing called the depression, it's capitalism. And so he became a left-wing radical um, and kind of organized his whole literary mission around this idea. He wanted to show really a suffering that was happening uh, across the country and how this was all rooted in a system that he thought was very brutal and unjust. Um, and he wasn't alone in doing this. There were thousands probably of writers at the time who were you know, declaring themselves to be on the side of the left, uh, whether they were joining the Communist Party or in its orbit or the Socialist Party or just kind of becoming freelance radicals. It was extremely common. Um, and over the years in this period, these uh, organizations popped up called the John Reed Clubs, which were sort of in the Communist Party orbit, but they were a little more autonomous in the beginning. And Nelson Algren joined, Richard Wright joined, other people like that. He was friends with <laughs> Richard Wright too, and yeah. who also worked and, and who will come up shortly. Yeah, yeah, they met through the John Reed Club first. So they kind of had this relationship um, in the kind of radical politics world before they ever joined the Federal Writers Project together. Um, but this was a trend that was going on all across the literary world. And it wasn't just young people like Algren. You had, um, I talk about in the book, uh, Sherwood Anderson, who had already been kind of an established writer for a long time. Um, but he came out as this kind of fervent communist for a brief period uh, after the Depression. And he signed a letter with all these other well-known writers um, where during the 1932 election, they were calling for a vote for the Communist Party candidates. Um, the Organization of Professionals for Ford and Foster was what it yeah. was called. Yes, with yeah. Ma which but, Malcolm Cowley was yeah. part of as well. He wrote um, part of the pamphlet, yeah. Yeah, so that was, a, that was just kind of a sign of the times. Um, and then Anderson ended up becoming more of a staunch New Dealer in a few years after that. Um, so there's a lot of fluidity in terms of what people were thinking about their political approaches to the crisis that was afflicting the nation. Um, well, yeah. Algren, yeah, Algren stayed that way for most of his life. I mean, he was pretty ornery and he always was true to his roots. And um, so, but but he he did good work for the um, uh, for the field office. He and he did a lot of writing. I was really fascinated by this. He he, he wrote auxiliary publications. I love the fact that he wrote. A manual for caddies, which um, <laughs> the government paid for this, uh, but maybe at a higher plane, he wrote the, a guide to Galena, which is a town in Illinois that um, where Ulysses S. Grant was born, and um, that was that book was praised by Robert Cantwell in the New Republic mm -hmm. very highly, um, and and um, he also became friends with Studs Terkel who was not in the writer's project, but in the radio division, um, yeah. Yeah, he, uh, so it's funny because Studs Terkel is known today as this great oral historian. Um, and people would assume that when he was on the Federal Writers Project, he was doing that kind of work because that was a big part of what the project was doing. But he was actually, like you said, working on these radio scripts instead. So he was writing uh, a lot of pieces about the Chicago Art Museum that were airing just like little profiles of different artists and. All these different stories that um, they were doing in partnership with the local radio station and he wasn't involved with the oral history at all that came later but it clearly kind of gave him the idea when he was working on the project yeah so the next figure who comes up is the the really formidable zora neil hurston she was um, a trained anthropologist from the franz boas group in columbia she was a uh, just a first-rate folklorist and she was the author of the classic novel, Their Eyes Were Watching, wa watching God. She's really fascinating, multi-talented, multi-dimensional. And she sort of ended up working on, on the Florida Guide. Um, tell us what she did for them. And, and she, well, anyway, just start off because she's such a fascinating figure in, in a half a dozen, a dozen ways, really. Yeah, so Zora Neale Hurston at that time was kind of at the peak of her fame, I would say, during her lifetime at least. Um, yeah, she'd written Their Eyes Are Watching God. She was kind of well known as a 
serious scholar of uh, folklore and folkways as an anthropologist. She had this kind of great academic background, but she was also writing popular books and, and plays and, uh, you know, writing her novels too. So she had, you know, all these different aspects to her. And when she joined the project in Florida, she was really qualified to be the director of the whole project. Like, there are people who directed the project in other states who are not nearly as qualified as she was um, as a scholar, as a writer in general, or had any kind of popular reputation like that. Um, but the problem in Florida, of course, was that this was the era of Jim Crow and the project was segregated. So there's no way that they would ever allow her to actually run the project. And even the woman who ran it at the time, Corita Kors, a white woman, who was like fairly liberal in a lot of her ideas for the time, um, I think she recognized this, but she wasn't going to make waves with the establishment of Florida and the other WPA officials in the state um, by insisting that Hurston had a higher role. So she actually was forced in this pretty low role and she, her, she technically worked at home. She didn't work in the office on a daily basis, but she would send in packets of information that they would weave into the guides because she had such a rich storehouse of information that she'd collected about uh, folklore and folkways uh, throughout you know, the last decade or so that she was working on this just as her own personal pursuit. Well, I think it's to the point to mention that she was born in Florida yeah. and lived in a community called Eatonville and uh, uh, really, loved Black American life in, in all its um, particularities. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so that fed into her um, folklore. I mean, she knew that territory better than just about anybody with a, with a college education. Yeah. And you, but so I want to talk about the racial politics of the guides, especially in the South because needless to say, that's, uh, as, they, as we say now, contested territory, how to describe the history of that time and place. And, and um, there was a man uh, you write about called Sterling Brown, who was a black scholar, who was kind of an unofficial censor in the Washington uh, office, whose job was to sand down some of the most egregiously racist and um, condescending um, copy that would come in from the Southern guidebooks, right? Right, yeah, absolutely. Um, pretty early on in the history of the project, they decided, they as in Henry Ellisberg and some of the other people who were close with him uh, working on this, they decided that they needed an editor who you know, themselves was black and would look at all the black material that was being collected by the project to kind of like give it a once over and filter out all the really egregious racist stuff that they kind of expected, frankly, that would come from certain places in the country, especially in the South. Um, so Sterling Brown was the person they selected for that job. And it was kind of this impossible task in a lot of ways because he would get material that just, you know, there are letters from him to the other people in the FWP where his mind is just spinning. He's like, how could someone submit this? How could they talk about Tennessee and not even mention Fisk University or something like that? Um, so he had this really Herculean task in front of him with a couple of assistants. It wasn't just him doing it by himself. Um, yeah, that was his role to basically give everything the once over to write up memos, uh, critiquing what was coming in, especially from the South and presenting it to Allsburg and other people in DC. Um, so you had this kind of this struggle of different forces because the state directors in the South sometimes really resented his uh, you know, input on these different things and they would fight back and they would say, you know, this is how we describe this war between the states here. We use that term instead of the civil war and that's something they fought for. And if you look at uh, some of the guys from the South, that's the term that's there, the war between the states, although it doesn't show up in other At least they didn't call it the war for North of Northern aggression. Yeah, I mean, that's really- they wanted that's, to. Yeah, that's a good point. It's kind of, because there really was this contested, uh, you know, terrain that the, the national office in DC was, was fighting it out with the Southern offices. So they had to compromise on things. So there are, aspects of the guides that we would look back on today and say, or do look back on today, and kind of raise their eyebrows and say, oh, that's not very good at all. That's pretty awful. Yeah. Um, but it was kind of the best that they could get at the time. But people like Sterling Brown were there trying to improve it, you know. So even on the African-American side, there was not unanimity of opinion. Um, and Zora Neale Hurston uh, crossed swords with Sterling Brown himself, and and she she had a real feud with your final figure, Richard Wright. Um, they had very, they, I think they reviewed each other's books um, Absolutely. quite unfavorably. And Wright did not like, their eyes were watching God uh, at all because he thought it was too 
colorful, I think, and not radical enough, not harsh, har harsh enough about the realities of African American life. And, and Hurston, who is kind of by temperament a cultural conservative, I think, uh, really didn't like the radicalism of, of Richard Wright's um, posture. But anyway, let's talk about him because, it, because uh, he's, I think he's the great success story in many ways of the, of the project. Um, he's of course, African-American, Chicago native, and he started working in the Chicago office. And I think he was the first black supervisor in that office, but um, eventually he got himself moved to New York City where the real literary action was. And that um, launched him really. So tell us how that happened. Sure, yeah. So Richard Wright had worked in Chicago for a bit and he was friends with Nelson Algren who was coming in there too. Um, but yeah, he'd been working on his own writing, his own fiction, and he really wanted to branch out and to, you know, to reach a higher level. And he was a John he Reed Club, Club alumnus, yeah. Yeah, yeah. he was editing uh, the magazine of the chapter of the John Reed Club in Chicago. So that kind of like gave him his start um, in a literary sense, was the, the radical world. But he knew he would needed to reach something bigger and he thought that New York was the place to do it. So he decided that he was going to leave the project in Chicago, go to New York. Um, he didn't have a job lined up yet. He just kind of thought it would all fall into place and it didn't quite work out that way because they had really strict requirements in terms of who could get hired according to uh, their residency status in a particular state. So when he got there, um, he had great endorsements from all these people. I think Henry Osberg even wrote on his behalf um, who knew that he was this extremely talented writer and he had been a great editor too in Chicago, um, but a WPA administrator who was you know, outside the Federal Writers Project but part of the WPA said, I completely understand, but we have to give um, you know, preference to people who are actually from New York and have lived here for a long time before we can hire people who just moved here. So he was kind of stuck in limbo for almost a year, I think, um, working for the Daily Worker, the communist newspaper as a correspondent in Harlem. So that kind of gave him his introduction to New York City, uh, you know, familiarized him with the area. Then he finally did get on the project in New York and he was working on uh, some of the material that went into the guidebooks. Um, but what really was remarkable about his time there is that he ended up working on this creative writing unit, which was unique to New York City um, for the most part. Um, it was this thing that Henry Allsberg kind of dreamed up talking to other people and they kind of kept it a secret because they knew that uh, the FWP's mission didn't include paying writers to write fiction on you know, government time with taxpayers' dollars. And Allsberg wanted to support these people who he thought were so talented, had so much potential, um, but really couldn't work on their own stuff that easily unless they were devoting full time to it. Um, so he initiated this project clandestinely. It was all kind of organized with the director of the New York City project at the time verbally. And they put together a little group and basically said, you're gonna get your paycheck. You've proven yourself to be really good, you know, valuable parts of the project. So go home and work on your fiction or your poems. And then every, you know, so often show up and show us what you're doing. So Richard Wright did that. And uh, what he worked on during that time was Native Son or the book that would become Native Son. Well, well, he he also um, uh, he wrote a reminiscence of life in the South, his life yeah. in the South, yeah. called "Living Jim Crow," which, uh, which which was in an anthology uh, called "American Stuff," mm -hmm. and it it got it got him a lot of attention, and I I took the occasion to read it, and boy, is it powerful. Um, it's just about what it was like to live as a black man in at that time and place. And it it got the attention of um, a um, Harper and Harper Brothers editor, Ed Aswell. And that led to his first book, Uncle Tom's Children, mm -hmm. which people are still reading today. And they should be reading yeah. today. And that and that led to Native Son, right? Which is uh, which is one of the big noises of of the nineteen of nineteen thirties literature. So it was real. I mean, uh, it was the making of Richard Wright. Yeah, definitely. He he actually he won a contest that was for uh, WPA workers, a literary contest, um, and the award for it was he. I think he got a monetary award, and then it was you got a book contract, and that right. was the contract that led to Uncle Tom's Children being published. 
Um, so then by the time Native Sun came out, you could see this chain where every step along the way, he was being boosted up by the project. Um, and it's really a question of whether much of this would have happened without it, not because he wasn't talented or driven enough, but because who knows what kind of work he'd been able to do if he wasn't you know, given this kind of literary work. Um, he could have been digging ditches like he was originally in Chicago before he got on the Federal Writers Project and had no time or energy to do this kind of writing. So he really was a great example of the uh, literary Listen, contribution of the product. You and I as editors know that accidents are, happy accidents are important in any literary career. Right. So Richard Wright was a communist. He was a card carrying communist. And that's um, important to mention because we now come to the end of the Federal Writers Project. And we bring on to the stage a man named Martin Dyes, a congressman from East Texas, Democrat, former New Dealer, but nativist, and, and eventually a disaffected Democrat. And he decides, he's, he's the guy who established the House Un-American Activities Committee. And their definition of un-American activities was slightly fascist, but mostly aimed at the left. And one of their first targets was the was um, the WPA, the, the uh, federal number one, and specifically the um, federal theater. Um, I forget what it's called. The the yeah, federal Fly theater project project and the federal writers project and both of these. Hallie Flanagan and Henry Allsberg were dragged before the committee and tell us what happened. Yeah, there was um, one of these moments where it's like the whole life of the project was leading up to this big showdown. Like if you ever made a movie, it just seems like the natural way to, to build up to this climax and you almost wouldn't believe it, but that's really how it happened. This um, is 1938. Uh, yeah, late 1938, um, they had been, the committee had been investigating, you know, all different groups um, and individuals, but especially focusing on the Federal Writers Project and the Theater Project. And they were uh, bringing up people who were kind of these disaffected former workers who had access to grind and they would complain about things on the project and make all these generalizations. And They were thinks. The word is they were really thinks. Yeah, as no, that's, a, there's a guy, Edwin Banta, who I talk about in the book, who is this really despicable character who, uh, Kind of considered himself a spy and he ended up coming to the, the investigators with all this information um because he had joined the communist party and all this other stuff but it turned out he was this you know fascist he was in the kkk and he uh, kind of had this ignoble end uh, a few years later where he tried to uh, blackmail a journalist who had revealed his kind of like hard right-wing past um and then was caught and sent to jail basically so you had some pretty shady characters who were lining up against the project at the time um, but also just people who had, you know, the usual kind of criticisms of projects like this and wanted to air them. Um, so anyway, Henry Osberg and Hallie Flanagan of the Federal Theater Project go up in front of the committee because they want to defend what they're doing. Uh, Hallie Flanagan was really, you know, she was this really great character. She was the defender that the projects needed in Congress, I think. She was very eloquent and feisty. Um, she had this kind of legendary line where one of the people on the committee was asking her about someone and it's not quoting something she had written about Christopher Marlowe, the playwright um, from many <laughs> centuries ago. And uh, this congressman is like, who is this Marlowe? And she's like, well, you know, he's a playwright. It's like, just tell us who he is for the record. And she said something like, oh, he was the you know, greatest dramatist of the period of Shakespeare immediately preceding Shakespeare. And everyone laughed because the committee thought this was some like subversive radical guy in New York City who was undermining the Federal Writers Project with his plays. But of course he wasn't. Um, but for Hallie Flanagan, she's experienced this moment of this kind of shocking thing where she said, you know, this is all funny and totally absurd, but we have thousands of people whose jobs are on the line, not to mention the, you know, the possibility of these projects being destroyed when they're just like starting to contribute all this to American culture. So she took that kind of tack when she was testifying. Henry Osberg came up and he decided to be very deferential and cooperative, um, I think strategically, because he didn't want to antagonized the committee. He wanted to try to save what he was working on. So he answered all their questions. He admitted that there were all these issues with, um, you know, certain people on different projects, including the New York City project in particular, kind of raising a ruckus and they had labor problems all the time, which was kind of very across. They're everything. always picketing the office. Yeah, in New York City, it was this kind of hotbed of uh, labor activity and radicalism. And it caused a lot of disruptions whenever they would uh, have cutbacks to the 
WPA workforce, people would protest and they'd have hunger strikes and shut down the operation. So it was kind of a headache for a while. Um, but his point was that they were doing the work and the books were coming out and people were reading them and loving them. And they weren't these kind of like subversive, uh, you know, attempts to undermine the American project. They were, you know, what exactly what they were supposed to be. And that all this other stuff was kind of happening on the sides and was just creating a lot of, you know, heat and noise in the headlines, but didn't really have any impact on the, the way the project functioned. So he kind of finished his testimony and I think he thought he did a really good job and, you know, everything was going to work out. But uh, after that, the federal theater project was completely disbanded. The writer's project was kind of devolved down to the state level. They changed the whole structure of it and Ellsberg was fired. Um, so that was really the, the fatal blow to the project, even though it existed for a few more years after that and put out some of the guides that hadn't come out yet. Um, well, it, it seemed that, that, that well, for, first off, I, you should, we should point out that that was part of the larger attack on the New Deal. Yeah. But by, by that point, I, I guess the anti-Roosevelt forces had um, gotten the range, you know, and and um, and Roosevelt, the Roosevelt administration had made some strategic errors of its own. Right. So so it was part of something larger that was going on. Um, but you do make the point that by that by that time. There were so many books either on press or ready to go uh, that um, uh, that uh, um, it they they they, did, they finally came out and then the whole cultural project of the country moved from the depression to the the war effort and 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 so by the early forties it just kind of dissipated yeah so it so. I mean, but mission accomplished really in many ways. I mean, before we go to the questions, I, I really want to bring up the contemporary relevance of what you've written, your subject, because when you were starting this book, you thought you were telling a, a rich and important American cultural story, but that was then, and here we are now, but in after the year, that we had and the way that the big questions of the role of government in American life and what is infrastructure? Is infrastructure just roads and dams or is it human infrastructure? Um, could there be something, could the government do something like this again? And I do wanna point out that your book is getting terrifically fine reviews in the right places. and. The reviews I've read all say all bring up this question, and and there's even some um, efforts in Congress along these lines. So to talk talk about what it means to us now and what we can learn and about what to do in this and to support American culture. Sure. Yeah. I mean, yeah. When I started really looking into the, you know, I had had my own set of these American guides for a while before this. Why don't you show us? Could you show us a, a couple of those books? just yeah. because they're so impressive as objects. So here I have a, a little stack here. Here's the Pennsylvania Guide. Um, yeah, you can see these are really hefty books and this is kind of the average size of one. Um, this one I love on the cover because the art is by, it's by Howard Cook, who was an artist who worked for the, or the section of fine arts of the treasury department. It had a couple of different names, so I had to check it. Um, but this was the organization that was really responsible for all these post office murals that appeared all over the country and a lot of them still exist. This is a segment from his post office mural. Um, just one of the examples of all these different kind of cultural projects that the New Deal was initiating. Um, and here you have it on the cover of Federal Writers Project Guide. So this is kind of the, um, you know, to use a corporate buzzword, like the synergy between the different cultural aspects of the New Deal um, right here on the cover of Pennsylvania. I should show you, this is the New York City Guide. There's still an edition of this out there that you can buy. Some of these exist in later editions. Um, New York City actually had two volumes. There's this one, which is a guide to the city, which is exactly what it sounds like. There's another book called New York Panorama, which is a collection of essays about the city, different aspects of the history. And like I just ordered that on ABD books. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah, it's great. It's like a two volume. Show us uh, one more. Show us Wyoming, I think, or... Well, I have I have Idaho right here. Okay, Idaho is good. Important. Yeah, this is the uh, the one that Vardis Fisher created himself. The first one that came out. 
And this one, as you can see, um, you know, if you take all the guidebooks and line them up together, they're all basically the same size, even though they were published by multiple different publishers, they coordinated it so that it would be like one uniform set. But if you compare Idaho to the other guidebooks, you can see it's quite a bit bigger. Yeah, well, that's Vardis Fisher, right? Yeah. That's right. That's the mark of Vardis Fisher's uh, ego, I guess. Right. Anyway, so so it can, could it happen again? Should it happen again? How can it happen again? I think uh, yes, yes, and I am not totally sure. <laughs> That's a great <laughs> question. Um, you know, when I started working on this book in earnest, it was late 2016, early 2017, and something like this seemed like you know a great story from the American past, but a thing that would never ever happen today, especially for decades. You know, people wrangle over how much funding the National Endowments for the Arts will get. Uh, so the question of running a completely state-supported, you know, employment agency like this, we're not an employment agency, but something that hired people directly, put them to work on this collective effort, uh, seemed like it would never, ever happen again. And then during the pandemic, when it first started, I started seeing all these articles popping up where people were calling for some kind of resurrection of the New Deal arts projects, because people who were cultural workers were hit by the pandemic in a, such a severe way. I mean, so many people were, but if you were a musician or a you know, person in theater world, yeah, 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 yeah. you dancer, you're like, you're, of course, you can't work when uh, no one can come to your shows or your performances. Uh, writers had it a little bit better, but of course there's been this crisis in the arts and in the writing world and the journalism world for years now where people have been grappling to struggle or grappling with the you know demands of the gig economy, the digital revolution has changed everything, the way people make a living from writing. Um, so all this has kind of been compounded by the pandemic. And then, like you said, um, new legislation was introduced, I think, in early May by uh, Ted Lieu from California, Representative Ted Lieu and Representative Teresa Ledger Fernandez from New Mexico, um, calling for a new federal writers project for the 21st century. And just really briefly, it sounds like this new legislation would uh, disperse grants through the Secretary of Labor to all different organizations and institutions, libraries, uh, communications unions, and then, of course, like educational institutions and different literary groups. Uh, to have people go out and kind of take down the stories of their fellow citizens uh, with an emphasis on how people have weathered the pandemic, but also just how they've lived for the last, you know, several decades, what the state of American life life is like today, uh, which is what federal writers did in the 30s. They went out there and kind of charted America and tried to create this national self-portrait um, piece by piece from the ground up all across the country. And so the idea behind this legislation, I think, is that they could do something like it again even though it wouldn't quite be the same as the original federal, federal Writers Project, which is its own freestanding organization that gave people jobs and hired them full time. Uh, this would be more like recapturing the spirit of the project in a contemporary setting. Yeah. Well, when I was an editor, I used to use the phrase the heartbreak of nonfiction mm. because you you publish a nonfiction book and it's um, so dependent upon the news cycle and you know larger events. But in this case, it's um, the happiness of nonfiction because, because, because I think the timing for your book is really beautiful. And um, I really hope, and I think it will help to inform the national discussion on that. So you've contributed in two, two fashions by resurrecting an important part of our cultural history and helping us grapple with what we're, um, we're all grappling with now. So um, if are there any, I, I gather there are some questions from the floor, Max. So if you want to um, throw them out for Scott, of course. Yes, uh, thank you both. This has been, this has been excellent. There, there are um, several questions. I'll, I'll just ask a few for the time that we have left. The first uh, from Isabella Biedenharn. She, she asks, how did you first hear about the Federal Writers Project? And uh, I've added to that. And what was it that originally made you want to write about it? Sure, yeah, that's, um, I tell the story a little bit in the book, actually. Um, I had a great uncle who was a book collector and he started buying the American Guides when he was a young man. He was in his mid twenties, I think. And the first book he wrote was in 1942. So it had just been published. Um, and he basically became this really fervent collector of Federal Writers Project publications. And he amassed hundreds of them, I think over 300, close to 400 publications, um, in addition to a much bigger book collection that involved a lot of other things that was all pretty interesting. He was kind of a curious figure, but a really dedicated book collector. Um, he died in 2005, and then the, the main set of American guidebooks ended up with me. My parents were 
thoughtful and nice enough to uh, put them aside. And they thought, you know, these are these kind of strange, outdated books that, you know, are kind of uh, kind of interesting, I guess, if you're into that sort of thing. And I thought I was into that sort of thing. So they made sure I got them. And I got, kind of had them hanging around, um, you know, in my house and in their house for a while. Um, and I thought they were great. You know, I, I knew the story only in the broadest outlines of how they were created. But every once in a while, I'd take one down and read through it. And, you know, like I was kind of saying at the beginning, you don't really expect to open up a travel guide and then just found all this totally fascinating, you know, history, all these little historical anecdotes and tidbits of weird information and stories and kind of dubious tales that sometimes the guys will even say, like, this might not be true, but it's a great story. Um, and they are great stories. And so I started really researching the history and reading about it. And then I learned about all these, you know, great writers who are part of it and all these other fascinating characters who are not so much remembered today, but really live these extraordinary lives and contributed to the project. And that just piqued my interest. Um, and I have to say, like, when I first really was getting serious about working on this book, um, I guess it was Harold Holzer in the beginning who said something about how I was working in, you know, in editing uh, with a, at a book publisher. And I decided to do my own book. And I was kind of looking for my own subject. But after Trump was elected, um, you know, there are a lot of these ideas circulating that I thought were really kind of damaging. And, uh, you know, these kind of nativ nativist ideas about what America meant and who it was for. And I saw in the American, you know, guidebooks that they were putting out this different philosophy of what it meant to be part of America and who was included in that. And it was, you know, from a different time period, it has its limits and everything. But I think there was something valuable and that, that I wanted to try to, uh, you know, recover and to tell that story again for people today. And I thought it was just going to be something that people interested in the time period would want to read about. But of course, like we were just saying, everything has changed in the last couple of years, especially over the last year. So now it's much more urgent and relevant than I ever expected it to be. Yeah, um, that's great. Another question, an anonymous questioner asks, do we know whether there was much of a readership for the state guidebooks? And um, if so, do we know who was reading? What kind of readers did the book, did these books have? Sure, yeah. I mean, um, absolutely. Some of the books were bestsellers at the time. Um, I think they did much better than what a lot of people expected. Like the New York City guides were published by Random House and, you know, Bennett Cerf, the great publisher, was the president at the time. And there are letters to him writing to the Federal Writers Project where while the book was being created, he was really getting angry because it was such a dysfunctional process. And he was kind of saying, you know, I'm only putting up with this for so long because of my admiration for the whole project and the New Deal and not because I'm happy with how you guys are handling it. Um, but then when the book came out, he said, you know, everyone here thinks it's one of the best books that we've ever published and the response has just been tremendous. So these are really popular trade books. Um, people, you know, it was reviewed, they were reviewed in all the major newspapers and magazines. The Idaho Guide, when it came out, I think had, I forget the number, but there were hundreds of reviews that came out all across the country because it was the first guidebook. So it got this national attention. And every single one of them was positive. Um, so you had just ordinary people were buying these. They weren't, um, you know, kind of only appealing to people with literary interests or people who are diehard New Dealers or something. People wanted to read guidebooks about their own state. And then when other guidebooks are coming out, like the towns and regions and even counties, that sort of thing, people were buying those too because they wanted to see how they were represented uh, in, you know, these publications or if they were represented. It was really important to them. If, if I could just put my two cents in, yeah. I mean, another really interesting aspect of this whole thing is that it was a, a public-private um, um, partnership. I mean, the, the books were done on the um, government's dollar, but then the big, the big publishers like Viking and Simon & Schuster and Random House took, took on the books. Maybe I think they would have given advances and they took on the task of bringing the books to uh, readers, which is of course what they were good at. So th that's a, I think that's kind of a possible model for the present day as well, an aspect that should not be forgotten mm -hmm. that, there, that, that, that there was private enterprise involved in the dissemination of these, of these books. Yeah. Can, yeah. Can, I, can I add something to that really quickly? Yeah. Um, so when in 1939, when the project was really under attack and it looked like it might go under completely, uh, 44 of those big publishers signed a letter, an open letter that they published, basically saying that the project was so important and contributed so much to them and to booksellers and printers and, of course, all the writers who worked for it, but also to the national culture and that they, as private commercial publishing houses, wanted it to go on and thought that it should be supported. Um, so it kind of, you know, rejected the idea that a lot of critics of the project were putting out there that, 
this was a threat to private industry. The government should be doing this because it's going to deter or, well, you know, or stop uh, you know, private publishing houses from doing this sort of thing. And they were saying, no, ex exactly the opposite. It's that kind of synthesis between public and private that made the project so valuable because it would have never happened otherwise. Anne-Marie Cunningham uh, asks, well, she says, she mentions that Eudora Welty took photos for the WPA. Um, did she also work for the Writers Project? I think my understanding of this is that Eudora Welty worked for a WPA publicity division. Um, she didn't actually work for a writer's project, you know, operation specifically, but she was working for the WPA in a different capacity. And some of the photographs she, she took ended up in the guidebooks. Um, but you had a lot of that where the guides would use things, especially from the Farm Security Administration, a lot of those famous photographs by like Walker Evans and Roy Stryker and that sort of thing, uh, they ended up in the guides. So they were drawing on all these different resources across the federal government. And I think that's how Eudora Welty became involved. But she wasn't, you know, obviously one of the great writers of the 20th century, but she wasn't actually participating in the project as a writer. She was there as a photographer. Herbert Weller asks, how much were the writers paid? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, oh, geez. I did, you know, it's funny. When I was working on this book, uh, there's a lot of information about the actual pay rates and how different people were getting paid different amounts. And I always ignored it. And I kind of made this decision, decision where I said, you know what, saying someone gets paid $25 a week or something is not going to mean that much to readers in the 21st century. So I just, I, I didn't focus on that as much. But the idea was that they got paid a pretty comfortable living wage. It wasn't a lot. Um, but for people who were at the lower levels, it was enough to absolutely keep them alive. They worked a normal work day. So they had time to go home and work on their own stuff after that. Um, of course, people higher up, like Henry Osberg, they made a bit more. Um, they didn't make tons of money, but it was it was considered like a comfortable living wage, I think. Brian Gill asks, do some books have better or more thorough reference sources? And are some books more biased to certain cultures? That's a good question, too. Um, I think you can see how, so there's always this tension between the books that are being written at the local level on the state level and then what the national office in DC was trying to do to impose, impose this kind of uniformity. So you have books that are definitely, um, have a more authoritative field. Sometimes they're written better, they just feel smoother than certain books from some states that didn't have that kind of you know, quality going into it from the grassroots level. Um, off the top of my head, I mean, there's a, definitely a big issue where a lot of the Southern guides don't pay that much attention to uh, you know, black life in those states. Or sometimes they talk about black people there in a kind of condescending way that was, you know, part of the culture in the 30s. Uh, and the national office pushed back on that to some extent, but they also let a lot of it slide. So I think if you take a book like the New York City Guide and you look at the sections on Harlem, some of which were written by Richard Wright and uh, Claude McKay, too, and just another, you know, tremendous writer who's part of the New York City Project. And you compare that to how the Alabama Guide, for instance, writes about black people in that state, you can see the difference. It's, it's really noticeable. Um, in terms of different cultures, just to finish up, like, yeah, it depends. You have to look at different books. Um, there are definitely blind spots in the guides, things that we would say today are like, as much as they tried to be inclusive as they could, they left a lot of things out too. And that's just more reason to get back to what we were talking about, about the 21st century Federal Writers Project, things that a new iteration could build on, you know, looking at these limits of the old project. Um, Dan asks, did any other nations dealing with the effects of the Great Depression enact any similar programs to revitalize employment and culture similar to the Federal Writers Project? Not that I know of. Um, something on this scale in terms of being a, you know, an effort to chart the entire country and not just say collect folklore or look at, you know, information from a certain region or something like that. I never came across anything that was even remotely like this. Um, I'm sure some things have happened since then, but during the depression, um, you know, obviously things in the Soviet Union were a little bit different where they had these kind of public state-led uh, cultural enterprises, but they were much more narrowly focused, I think. Uh, they weren't doing something like this vast charting of the whole country from the grassroots level up, which is what was happening here. Jennifer asks if you would talk a bit about how you approached the research for this book. Uh, yeah, sure. So I, I kind of wanted to, you know, I'm, I'm not an academic historian. I think of myself more as a journalist, I guess, a cultural critic. Um, so I wanted to try to tell the story in a way that synthesized a lot of the academic work that people had done over the years, which is really important and really valuable. Um, and I owe a huge debt to all those people. Um, but to tell the story in my own way by focusing on these different people. 
though I did a ton of reading in all the secondary literature, I spent a long time really doing that, familiarizing myself with what was out there. Um, and actually, if you if you get a chance to look at the book, there's a note in the back about uh, further reading and sources and that, you know, I think will be really helpful if people want to read more about the Federal Writers Project and learn more about it. They could consult that and see some of the things that helped me. Um, so that was one part of it. But then the other part is I did a lot of archival research and most of the records for the Federal Writers Project are in the National Archives in College Park, actually not in Washington, D.C. Um, and in the Library of Congress. So I took many, many trips down there. I have some really good friends who live in Washington who let me stay at their house and I kind of became a frequent guest of theirs over a period of about two years. I come down for a week at a time and stay with them, spend all day in the archives and come back. Um, and there's just a huge, huge amount of material there. There's way more than anyone can go through in a lifetime. Um, like I was saying to someone recently, you know, Robert Carroll, the great biographer and researcher has this line about how when you're doing research, you should turn every page. Like you have to get every box out, open it up, turn every page of every document if you want to really do a thorough job. And I think that he is right uh, in a lot of ways, but that only works if you have the decade or so to write a book. And if you're on a much shorter deadline, like I was, you have to be really strategic about what you're doing. Also, if you have a researcher to do it for you. <laughs> That's true. I did. Some I of did us hire, don't. <laughs> yeah, I did hire one researcher who helped me by. So one of the issues is that, you know, most of the records are in Washington, but they're also scattered across the entire country in archives in every state. Um, in state archives, like in Trenton, has in New Jersey's archives. Um, but also in universities. So there's tons and tons of stuff. You can never cover all of it. So I did hire a researcher to go to the Abraham Lincoln Museum in Illinois, which has all the Illinois project records somehow. I guess it's a state archive. Um, and she was a huge help and could go there and take pictures for me because I couldn't really justify buying, buying a plane ticket and going out there and looking at that as much as I wanted to. Um, so yeah, it was a little bit, it was, it was complicated doing this research. Like when I first went to the National Archives, I met an archivist there who was kind of the expert on the New Deal WPA holdings. And he was kind of telling me what to look for and how I should request the boxes and stuff. And finally he said, you know, throughout all of your research, how many of these boxes do you eventually want to look at? And I was just kind of like, you know, all of them eventually. And I just saw his eyebrows go up and he looked at me and he's like, you're going to be here for a very long time if you try to look through all of them. Um, but thankfully, they're organized in such a way where you can zero in on different, you know, aspects of the administrative records that are helpful, look at different states. So I kind of followed that uh, route while I was trying to, you know, figure out what this story was all about. That's great. We, we're nearly out of time. So I want to give you both a chance to uh, give us any final thoughts you have. And also, maybe you want to address this final question as well from David Kippen, who asks of you both, what should people do to help Ted Lou's bill, um, write their senators and congressmen, editorialize. And I suppose our audience might appreciate a brief uh, description of what that bill is. Well, they should buy Scott Borchardt's book. Yes, <laughs> have a, you can have, okay, a link to do that in the chat. So maybe if I could just tell one personal story that I had, in which I was so delighted when, when I got Scott's book, because way back in 1974, when I was a lot younger and a lot healthier, and I was reading about the Civil War, I got interested in the Shenandoah Valley. And I thought, I want to see this place. And I, so I arranged to do a bike trip through the Shenandoah Valley. And to do my research, and I have no idea how I did this, how I got the book, I got the Virginia uh, the Guide to Virginia. And one of the tours that is in the book takes you down through the Shenandoah Valley. And so I must have Xeroxed the pages of that tour um, on the Shenandoah Valley. And I think I, I, think I took a um, train to Harrisburg and, and went south through Gettysburg and then down through the Shenandoah Valley using the Virginia guide as a way I'll, I'll go off to this road and and that road and the, the details are lost uh, either to history or my decaying brain cells. But I had a great time and, and, um, and it was, uh, and, and I'm very grateful to the, whoever con compiled the Virginia guide because, because that was a much richer experience that I would have gotten from any other guidebook. So uh, there's real value in these books. Thanks for that. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. And to kind of um, 
first to address what you said before and then to tie back to what you just said, Jerry. Um, so David Kippen is really one of the driving forces behind this new legislation. So I'm really glad he brought that up. Um, yeah, if, if people like this, this is what we were talking about before, this idea of a new federal writers project for the 21st century that would go out, survey life in America today, collect information on how people are living and put it all in this public depository so people could you know, access it just like you can access the records of the original federal writers project. Um, it's really urgent. I think that something like this could happen. The funding for it is a drop in the bucket compared to what the government spends on a lot of other things that frankly are probably not as worthy as something like this. So it's it, it seems like a, a huge task to create a federal writers project again, but I think it's really possible. And uh, like he said in his comment, you can write to your representatives in Congress, you can write letters to the editor, you can bring it up you know, whenever you can, write about it on Facebook, on Twitter, that sort of thing. And um, that's how legislation gets passed, you know, create this critical mass of support from the public, um, which is also how the original Federal Writers Project was created. I think a lot of people in the Roosevelt administration wanted to do something like this, but you had people who were, uh, you know, writers who were out there picketing for a long time in the beginning of the New Deal for a couple of years saying that we need a project like this for writers. Like um, uh, there was a sign in these big protests where they had all these, you know, they're writers. So they had all these call up for signs and one said, you can't get fat on a fireside chat. You know, the great words from the Roosevelt administration were important to a lot of people, but they needed this kind of material relief. And so that's how they uh, helped create the Federal Writers Project. And so I think what people can do uh, to both support this and to also kind of, you know, engage with the, the history of the original project is to do exactly, you know, what Jerry did and to look up the original publications, look up a guidebook, you know, if you're going somewhere, grab the guidebook, you can find a lot of them online. Uh, a lot of them are digitized. The original editions. Yeah, it's in the internet archive generally. Yeah, yeah, you can find almost all of them there and just see what happened in the area you're going to or look up the information about your hometown or where you live now and you'll find all kinds of amazing things that I think uh, if you spend a little time with them will increase your appreciation for the guides and also maybe make it clear why, you know, we could use something like this today and how much American society and literary culture too would benefit from it. That's terrific. We are over time. I, I just want to thank you both for this wonderful discussion and thank you to everyone who joined tonight. And uh, with that, we should sign off. So thank you both very much. Well, thank you for the opportunity to do this. It's been wonderful. Yes, thank, thank you both very much. And thanks everyone for watching tonight. Good night. Good night.